That's a blessing for sure. Turn in your Bibles to James chapter 4 this morning. James chapter 4. We're going to spend some time, uh, in fact, most of our time this morning in the Old Testament, but I um, have a verse here that I want you to consider before we dive into the Old Testament. <clears throat> There is a need in our lives. Um, there is a need in our lives for charactered people. Character, those qualities that one would hold or have that would set them apart, that would cause them to rise above, that would cause them to uh, stand out in any group. There's not a lot of character people in the world today, unfortunately. I think, well, maybe there are some, but less than there used to be. I think we're raising generations of uncharactered young men and women. And so I want to focus on a character trait this morning that I believe God is very focused on and uh, very interested in, and I plan to prove that from the scriptures, of course. But James chapter number 4, if you found your spot in James, find chapter 4 there, let's stand together, and let's look at just one verse here, we'll pray, you can have a seat, and then you can start heading back into the Old Testament, uh, the first and seconds, first and seconds, first and second chronicles, first and second kings. That's where we'll spend the bulk of our time this morning. But we'll begin and we'll end here, James chapter number 4. And I want you to notice with me verse number 6. It says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. God is very interested in humility. It is a character quality that God has talked about, that God has required. And here he says that this character quality of humility will bring about God's grace, but the opposite of humility is pride, and that will bring about God's resistance. And I don't know if you've ever had anybody to resist you before, but God can resist like no other. Let's talk this morning, but first let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your love for us. And Father, it is true we are a proud people. We live in a proud nation. We have proud leadership. We have a lot of proud followership as well. Father, there's just a lot of pride floating around the United States of America. We're proud about our kids, we're proud about our accomplishments, we're proud about our country, we're proud about just about everything there could be to be proud about, and I pray that you'd help us this morning that in all that pride to find a little bit of humility, that we might not stand opposed to you and that you might not stand opposed to us. Father, we might find ourselves in your grace this morning. We might do it through humility. We ask for your help. Father, I plead for your help this morning. I'm certainly as susceptible as any man to pride. I pray that you'd help me this morning to deliver this message in humility. For that's the only way that it'll get your blessing and your help in delivering it to the hearts and minds of men and women that are here listening. We ask for your help. We ask for your blessing. We pray that you'd intercede, Father, primarily in me this morning. And I pray that you'd use me to deliver your message of truth to your people and that they would take it to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. Anybody interested in the grace of God this morning? Amen. Oh, good. Anybody thinking they can stand up against God and hold their own? I don't think you can either. And I know I can't. 
What is this thing of humility? What is this thing of humility? Well, just in a, in a very simple kind of way, humility is not thinking too highly of yourself. It's realizing that whatever in my life I can look at and say, that's good. It didn't come from me. In fact, not only did it not come from me, if it's good and it's in my life, there are other people, but more importantly, there is God to thank. I'm very thankful for my kids. Some of them aren't kids anymore. <laughs> Several of them are now adults. I'm thankful that they're good people. You can thank my God and my wife for that. You say, well, they're not all good. You're right. You can thank me for that part. Just being honest with you. The faults and flaws that you see in my kids, I'll take the blame for that. In any case, whatever successes that I or you might have to our credit on our account or on our resume this morning, rest assured that God primarily and others certainly had some influence in bringing those things to pass. Even the Elon Musks of the world did not rise to where they are by themselves. Oh, they might have had a lot of good qualities about them, but let's just say there was a lot of people that undergirded them and, and built them up and their companies up and their ideas up. I'm just wanting us to understand this thing this morning. No one got where they got by themselves except for one place, a place called hell. You can go there all by your lonesome. Not that you'll be alone just that you can take all the credit for getting there. I want you to turn with me back into the Old Testament briefly. We want to consider a couple of examples and a couple of thoughts here. Second Chronicles, you'll find all those first and seconds together. You got first and second Samuel, and then first and second Kings, and then first and second Chronicles. We're a little look briefly at uh, second Chronicles chapter number 7, and we'll get to the other two of the first and seconds uh, here momentarily, but I want to point out a couple of things to you real quick. This passage is really the, the impetus of this message. This is where uh, I was reading when God showed this to me and pointed this out to me, and I wanted to bring this about. What we're reading about is the man named Solomon. Solomon, as most of you probably understand, David's son, first of all, King David's son, born out of a... Of course, he was married at this time to Bathsheba, but that was an adulterous affair when it started. And God, by His grace, brought about forgiveness. We'll get to about, about that in a moment. But anyway, Solomon was birthed out of that union, and he became the king. And on the day he became king, he, God asked him, he says, what, what do you want me to give you? And Solomon very wisely and very humbly said, I want to understand. I want to have wisdom and understanding that I might go in and out before your people to rule your people and, and, and to, to be a, a good king, essentially, is what he was telling God. And God says, hey, you didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for your enemies. I am going to give you what you asked for, and I'm going to give you more wisdom than anybody else, and I'm going to give you more wealth than anybody else. And so he was a very blessed individual. But let's be honest, he didn't get that by himself. God gave that to him. Now, most of you would know, and you've probably already crossed, it's probably crossed your mind and crossed your heart, Solomon made some very dumb decisions in his life. He's true, because he's a human being, just like you and I. And he can hold himself accountable for that. But Chapter 7 in 2 Chronicles, verse number 11. Notice with me. It says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord 
and the king's house. Now, I want you to just think about this for a minute. How many of y'all think that Solomon did all that work by himself? <laughs> How many of you think he probably did the work by sitting on the throne and supervising? <laughs> right? So this is the royal we did this, right? This is the royal we, Solomon, finished the house and the king's house. Notice it, go, it goes on, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, notice he prosperously effected. He had great, great victory. He did wondrous things there. The, the first temple that was built was absolutely phenomenal not to be redone. Uh, and it was just incredible. And Solomon's house was also, I'm told, very, very uh, ornate and very elaborate and uh, cost a, a, a pretty penny, if you will. But verse 12, it says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. And said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. Now listen, just remember, Solomon built the, the temple, but he couldn't make God choose it, and he couldn't make God dwell there, and he couldn't make God bless it, but God came to him and said, I'm going to do those, just that right? I, I have chosen this place that you built for myself and house of sacrifice. Verse 13. Notice what God says next. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. That's some very bad stuff. That's, that goes back to them in Egypt and the plagues that he sent on Pharaoh, right? God says, oh, by the way, I've chosen this house that you built for me. Good job. Looks great. But just so you know, in the future, if I decide I need to send these plagues. You say, would God do that? Yes, he would. Because he chastens those whom he loves. Let's read the next verse, a verse that we're familiar with, a verse that's been quoted on the national news by leaders of our country even. If my people, that is the people that he's chosen and the people that chose to follow him, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You caught the word there, right? If my people will humble themselves and to pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I. But listen, that whole string comes with this as a beginning. If my people will humble themselves. You realize that a lot of us pray. A lot of us seek his face even to some degree or another. Sometimes we turn from our wicked ways... But if there's pride resting in our hearts, none of the rest of that really is going to matter. Remembering James, he says, he resists the proud. Not going to help you. Not going to help you. Not going to, not going to help you. Uh, if you're humble, all of a sudden you've got God's attention. But if you're proud, friends, we can forget it. What we need this morning and what we need in our world today and what we need in our country, what we need in our homes and what we need in our hearts is this thing called humility. We need to humble ourselves. Listen again, Solomon's riding a huge wave of success at this point in his life, just finishing the temple, just finishing in his own house, uh, and, and God shows up with two messages. <laughs> First, 
You did the work. Looks good. I agree with it. I accept it. But the second is, you need to humble yourself. And especially if I start sending things to you, letting you know you need to humble yourself. If I send correction... Right? Verse 13. He said, if I send correction, if I send these plagues, if I send these corrections your way, my people need to humble themselves right now. And I will restore them. What was the right response according to God? Humility. Humility. By the way, anytime anything starts to go crazy in your life, anything starts to, to, to sh show a little shakiness, maybe in your finances, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your relationships, maybe, maybe just in your health or any other way, I I'm going to suggest to you today that the very first thing you should do is humble yourself before God. The very first thing you ought to do is take a step back and go, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm just going to humble myself and fall before God and say, God, I don't, know, I don't understand what's going on, but I need you to intercede because guess what? We need God to intercede. We can't do it ourselves. By the way, this election that's coming up on Tuesday, I'm going to cast my vote, but you know what? My vote is one of millions I need God to do something about the rest of them. Hold your finger back here. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Way back there in the, Old, in the New Testament. Way back there toward the end of your Bible. Toward Revelation. 1 Peter chapter 5. I've preaching, uh, been preaching for 1 Peter for a while now on the PM services. Go working my way through there. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're not there yet. In, uh, in the evening services, but let me give you this, this foretaste, this little preview. Notice what he says in verse 5 and 6 here, 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Listen, he's saying we need to be humble, and not just a little bit. It needs to be covering us. Our humility needs to be the first thing somebody sees about us. We need to wear it on the outside like a garment. Listen, the world today, by the way, Sunday school, the influence of the world, the lust of the flesh, and the deceitfulness of the devil. That's what we're talking about in Sunday school. What do those three things influence us as far as pride and humility? Don't they all say, be proud, be proud, be proud? Be proud of who you are. Be proud of everything about your life. Be proud. Listen, that's not what God says. God says be humble. Be broken. Understand that, that you are not the reason for all good things. In fact, if there's anything good, it probably wasn't you. It was probably God being gracious to you. So let me ask this question. We're going to go back to uh, 1 Samuel now for uh, a brief example. 1 Samuel, and I want you to look at chapter 15 with me. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, you'll find a man named Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. And I, I, we're not going to break this chapter down and and go through, but I just want you to see where I'm coming from and, and the text that I'm taking this from so you can understand this. Let me give you a brief, uh, brief summary here. King Saul, 
the, the key part of this text that you'll want to read is verse 9 down to about verse 23 is where these thoughts are going to come from that I'm going to present to you, all right? King Saul, first king of Israel, the first thing God tells him to do is go to battle against some of the kings that, that uh, were not so nice to the nation of Israel, and uh, so he does, and he gets sent off to battle. And God tells him how to conduct the battle and what, what to leave behind and what to bring home or not to bring home. He had specific instructions, which he promptly failed to follow. And when the prophet Samuel came to him as he came back from battle, leading all of the children of Israel and all, everything they brought with them, Samuel confronts him and says, you didn't do what God said. He was challenged and confronted by God's man, the prophet, and he denied, and he made excuses for, and he blamed others for the failure that he had. Do you know what he didn't do? He didn't humble himself. Not until way later. Notice with me verses 20 and 21 there in that passage, verses 20 and 21. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed, I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. Which what? Should have been utterly destroyed. He just admitted that he knew better. And he says, oh, by the way, they brought them back to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And if you read down, Samuel says this, God would rather have obedience than sacrifice. You know how some people say, well, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. You ever heard that? God says, that don't work with me. That don't work with me. By the way, will he forgive? Yes, he will. And yes, he does. But if that's your attitude, you probably don't have the right attitude to be forgiven. You're full of pride because you're going into it knowing you're going to be disobedient. That's exactly where King Saul was at. He said, it's not my fault. I did everything I was supposed to. And if, if anything's wrong, it's the other people. That's not humility. That's not what humility looks like. Let me show you what humility looks like. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. Just to write a few pages from there. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. You find now the second king of Israel. His name was David. And King David was a man just very much like you and very much like me, very much like Saul, by the way. He had flesh. He had fleshly desires. He was a man of like passions, just like the rest of us. And he sinned. In chapter 12 of, of this book, 2 Samuel, and really in several chapters, but right in this place, what we find out about David is he took another man's wife. And he didn't just take his wife, he took the man's life. Had him killed.
But here's the difference between David and Saul that I want you to see. This is the illustration of what humility should look like, right? Because let's face it, how many of us have sinned? And how many of us continue to sin? If you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourselves, and the truth is not in you. And you make him a liar, by the way, if you decline or deny your sinfulness. So in any case, chapter uh, 12 of 2 Samuel, notice with me verse 13. Verse 13 says, And David said unto Nathan, who was the prophet, by the way, that God sent to him, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, and thou shalt not die. What was the difference between David and Saul? It was humility. God saw both of these men sin. He witnessed it. Then he had his prophet, his preacher, go to them and confront them eyeball to eyeball and said, you messed up. And the difference between these two men is Saul said, uh-uh, wasn't me. I did everything I was supposed to. It's got to be somebody else's fault. And David said, you're right. I was wrong. That's what humility looks like, friends. That's what humility looks like. So I want to ask you this morning, how do you respond when you're confronted with sin in your life? How do you respond when you're confronted by God, by God's messengers, by God's people or God's word? Do we try to excuse ourselves? Do we deny? Uh, do we complain? Do we retaliate? Do we blame other people? Or do we do like David did and repent? With a brokenness of heart. With agreement. You're right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I failed. By the way, that's why David was known and is testified in the Bible as the man after God's own heart. Not that he was perfect, because he certainly wasn't. He did a lot of very dumb things. But when he was confronted by God for what he did, his habit was to humble himself and say, you're right, God, I, I, I messed up again. Please forgive me. It's important that we humble ourselves. It's important that we understand that the blessings, they didn't come because I'm so good. And very often, we don't do good, and we need to acknowledge that. I want you to look at 1 Kings chapter 21. Turn on to the right, another few pages there. 1 Kings chapter number 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. And let me ask this question as we begin examining the text here. How does God respond when men humble themselves? How does God respond when men humble themselves? Again, our text, James chapter 4, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Let's remember that. Of course, we saw what he did with King Saul, and if, if you're not familiar with the story, King Saul got to live until David was ready to be, be king, and then God killed Saul with, in battle with his son, most of them, and uh, David became king. When David sinned, because all do, and the prophet confronted him, he humbled himself, and God, the Bible said, if you read it, put away David's sin. He put it away. He dealt with it. He put it behind him. I want you to notice some more examples. 1 Kings chapter 21. Did you find your spot there? I want to show you two men. Two men that 
did something incredible. Two men that you're not going to believe it even when you read it. I want you to see two of the most wicked men the Bible talks about. The first one, his name's Ahab. We find him in our text right here. Ahab, 1 Kings chapter 21, was married to this precious, wonderful wife who loved him, supported him, helped him. Her name was Jezebel. He wasn't half the queen. He wouldn't have been half the queen, a king without Jezebel at his side. Verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 25 of 1 Kings. Notice what it says. But there was none, there was none like unto Ahab. So he was a real special guy. Notice, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Whom Jezebel, his wife, look how she helped him. She stirred it up. I'm talking about this incredible couple. I'm just glad they're not my neighbors. Verse 26, and he did, notice, very abominably. In following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. I'm just saying he was absolutely wicked. He was wicked. His wife was wicked, and the two of them combined were more than doubly wicked. But what did Ahab do that was so amazing? Look at verse 28. Jump down a little bit. Actually, no, let's not. Let's, let's read down. I want you to see this in the context. It says, and he did very abominably. That's verse 26, following these idols. Verse 27, it says, and it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, God sent the prophet to him. That it says he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted, means he didn't eat, and lay in sackcloth and went softly. Sounds like somebody had to change a heart, at least a little bit. Verse 28, and the word of the Lord came unto Elijah the Tishbite, saying, seest thou how Ahab, what's he do? Humbleth himself before me. You see, God took notice. God took notice of this wicked, extremely, extraordinarily wicked man. I mean, he was worse than anybody before. He's bad. Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Notice what God says next. Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon this house, his house. Horribly wicked, ungodly king who had an incredibly wicked wife. But when he humbled himself, God stood up, took notice, and extended grace. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Every time. For me, for you, for him, for David, for Saul, for Solomon, for anybody. We need humility. We must find it. We must get a hold of it. We must find ourselves humble. Look at another example. Continue on to the right to Second Chronicles chapter 
33, 2 Chronicles chapter number 33, find a second individual here. And listen, up to the point of Ahab and Jezebel, there wasn't anybody as bad as them. But it's fixing to get worse. God has nothing nice to say about this man, Manasseh. Chapter 33 of 2 Chronicles, look at verse 9. Verse 9, and, and the, the, really the text goes from 9 to 17. I'm not going to read it all for the sake of time. I just want you to see that and take a note of it and you can go back and study it. Just to understand this man, Manasseh's reign and his wickedness and idolatry that he had. Right? <clears throat> Verse number 9, so Manasseh made Judah, that's the state in Israel, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err. Notice, and to do worse, worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spanked to Manasseh and, and to his people, but notice, they would not hearken. Here you find a king in Judah, who makes his people sin. By the way, this might have some implications of our current situation in the United States of America. He made Jerusalem and Judah to err. He caused them to be worse than the heathens that God drove out before the nation of Israel when he gave them that land. And he would not listen to God's correction. But notice with me down at verse 12. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now listen, there's a lot of aspects, a lot of things about this story we could get into. We don't have time. I just want you to see these key thought. Here we've seen two very, very, very wicked men who happen to be leaders in Israel and, and see just how wicked they were. But we see something else about them. At some point and in some way, God got a hold of their heart and they humbled themselves. And God showed them grace. I ask you again, how many of you would like the grace of God in your life, toward your life, abounding in your life? But God giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth, but giveth grace unto the humble. Can I encourage you this morning? Can I beseech you this morning? Can I challenge you this morning? We need to find grace, God's grace. And the way we're going to find it is through humility. We're not going to rise up and fight. We're going to fall down and worship. By the way, just so you understand what I just said, Worship means to fall down. 
That's literally what it means. It doesn't talk about jiving all over. It doesn't talk about singing songs. Worship is one thing to fall down, humble yourself before God. That's what worship is. Now, I know that they have worship time, and we even call this time our worship time. But the sad thing is, not many people fall down before God. Even though we're invited to at the invitation. But I hope that you'll understand what I'm saying this morning when I say this there's something going on in your life, if there's something going on around your life, if there's something that you need the grace of God to deal with and to intercede for in your life, what you need to do is humble yourself. A lot of churches present this idea that worship is standing around waving your hands, singing songs, dancing around, flopping on the floor like a fish. And, and I, yes, that's a little funny, but it's really sad is what it is because that has nothing, absolutely nothing, zero to do with worship. Doesn't please God, doesn't honor God, doesn't represent God, doesn't anything with God. You only find that one place, and you can find it in the Bible. It's when Moses came back down with the Ten Commandments and threw them down to break them because of the way they were acting, and that's exactly how they were acting when Moses came down the mountain. But I'm going to close with this thought, and it comes from Ezekiel, two passages in Ezekiel this morning. You can find it there in Ezekiel chapter 18 if you'd like. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 18 says this in verse 32. For I have no pleasure, no pleasure. God says I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore turn yourself and live ye. Ezekiel 18, 32. I have no pleasure, God says, in the death of him that dieth. Wherefore, turn yourself and live ye. If you're in Ezekiel there, jump to chapter 33 and look at verse 11. He tells Ezekiel, he says, Say unto them in verse 11, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure. In the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? But you know what it takes to turn away from our wickedness? It takes humility. Just like it did with David, just like it did with Ahab, just like it did with, with uh, uh, Manasseh. You know, when Ahab got the message from God, you're, you're in big trouble, my friend. He tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth and he went softly, the Bible says. He demonstrated his humility before God. Friends, I want to encourage you this morning. I want to invite you this morning to get humble before God. Get humble before God and His authority and His Word. The world around you says, you don't have to be humble. You should be proud of who you are and what you are, how you are. God says, you go ahead and be proud, and I'll destroy you. But if you'll humble yourself, I'll show you grace. Your flesh certainly says this morning, don't humble yourself. You did nothing wrong. You, it's your life. You ought to enjoy it and live it the way you want to. But listen, your God says, I'm not going to have any pleasure 
in seeing you fall into a place called hell. So what you need to do is humble yourself and repent. That's what you need to do. And the devil says, oh, thou shalt not surely die. God says, oh, yes, you will. Because I will always resist the proud. And I will always give grace to the humble. So my invitation to you this morning is this. Who will humble themselves before a holy, before a mighty, before a gracious God? And find grace to help in the time of need. You say, well... You didn't list any particulars on the time of need. No, I don't think I need to, and I don't think I could list them all. Because it really doesn't matter what the time of need is. If you're surrounded by your enemies, you need to humble yourself before God, and He will help you. If you're sick, you will need to humble yourself before God, and He will help you. If you're financially impoverished, you humble yourself before God, and He will help you. And along with whatever the situation is, you might want to seek his word because he's already given us instructions on what to do on most of those issues. Let's stand together this morning. I say, preacher, you didn't mention my specific need. I don't need to. God's already dealt with you in your heart about it. Say, how did you know to preach this message this morning? I didn't. I begged God for help until he finally told me that I needed to preach about one word. You happen to be here for it. Praise God. Now the question is, are you going to be Saul or are you going to be David? Are you going to be a Saul or are you going to be a David? What's your response to God going to look like this morning? Father, thank you for this group. Thank you for these folks that you've gathered together here this morning, the message that you've delivered to me and asked me to bring to them. Father, to be clear, and you know this, but I'll say it for their benefit, I am no better than anyone here. I am no less sinful than any other under the sound of my voice. There's no reason for me to have pride in myself or of myself, for even this message is not mine, it's yours. Help us to be like David instead of like Saul. Father, even if our life has up to this point been a lot like Ahab or Manasseh, I pray that you'd find some area of humility in our hearts this morning that we might humble ourselves and go softly before you and you might extend grace in our time of need. Father, I pray that even in this moment we would come before you and worship and fall down and humble ourselves before you. And you might give us grace to help in our times of need. And we'll thank you for what you do and what you accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen.